The following is brought to you by paulacres.net. Paul, you're very welcome to the Scalax Insider podcast. I'm delighted and thrilled to have the opportunity to speak with you again today. Okay, well, Brandon, I'm happy to be here. We've had a great time, great conversation off camera as well. So I'm, I'm here <laughs> to help in any way I can. I'm not sure how much of that we can share, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> Paul, to say that you are fanatical about lean is a little bit of an understatement, but for those who are not familiar with the concept of lean, for the layman, what is lean? You know, I thought about that and I've answered this question many, many times, but I'm gonna answer it a little differently today. Lean is the ability for someone to peer deeply into their weaknesses and address them aggressively. When I learned lean 20 years ago, which is the Toyota production system, essentially, I was a very successful business person making, you know, I don't say this to be braggadocious, but I was making millions of dollars. I was doing well. I mean, everybody wanted to invest in my company and I was doing great. And my company was dialed in. When you looked at my company, it was it was mo- it was a model. It was clean. It was neat. It was organized. We were young, hip culture. I talk about this in my book. I everyone looked at me and said, "I want what you have." And I said, "Yeah, I'm I'm a pretty lucky guy." And then these consultants from Japan came into my company and told me I didn't know what I was doing. They showed me my weakness. They showed me my problems. They showed me the lack of insight I had to how the world really worked. And I was just like, what? I don't know this? And that is lean, the ability to look and peer inside of your weaknesses and address them aggressively. And that's what happened to me. They showed me my weaknesses and everything changed. It's a great definition. I've never never heard it described like that. I've never described it like that. (laughs) What was the journey before those consultants arrived into the company because what you're describing to me suggests a level of humility to invite people in to actually appraise what you're currently doing especially if you believe that what you're doing is already optimized so what led up to the point that those toyota consultants were in and then what was the defining moment for you to say, I need to do something more than what we're currently doing? Well, it's a great question. Here's the answer. I was never successful in life the way most people would define success. I was not an A student. I was, school was difficult for me. I was not a star in sports. I played sports. I went to school. I got C's and D's. I was not the best looking guy. I was just, everything about me was average. And, you know, when you're average, there tends to be a degree of angst about maybe why, why aren't you better looking? Why aren't you smarter? Why aren't you this? Why aren't you that? And so you kind of spend a little bit of time trying to figure out how to fix those things. I mean, that, that's the honest answer. In the process of having that disposition in life, not quite measuring up, I was always trying to fix things. I was always trying to improve myself. So what my life looked like prior to lean was I was always kind of trying to tweak it. I was reading the next book. I was, I was looking at people going, how come he didn't do that? And I can't do it. And, you know, and then I was adjusting, 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 adjusting. And the truth of the matter is that attitude was very beneficial to me because I became quite successful because prior to lean, I was very successful. Yeah. Right? I could have retired when I was 30 years old. I had acquired enough real estate. You know, I got my degree. Everything was difficult for me, but I, I followed this um, deliberate practice of trying to improve my life and, and etch away the, the rough spots. And it worked. But when I learned about lean, I, it was like, I'm trying to figure it all out. And then there's this system. And, and then when, it, when they unlock the key and I look, I open the door, I go, there's a system for doing this. It, it's all been laid out and it all makes perfect sense. And it, you, can, you can accelerate that mentality that I had exponentially. It was like, oh my gosh, this is what I've been looking for for the past 35 years. This is really interesting. So you had an obsession with self-improvement 
but sure. no one was directing or guiding you no. as to how you approach it. It's and, I had to figure it all out on my own. Right. And all of a sudden, these guys uh, from Toyota uh, come into your company, which is already very, very successful, mm -hmm. and they show you another way. So can you just, you know, give us a little bit of insight into why were they there and and what what mm -hmm. uh you, you know where where is that then where is right. that journey led to in terms of actually this lean just sure. permeating every aspect of your life so right. just go back to that moment yeah no no problem i'll go right back to that point what happened was so i was importing some raw materials from over in europe and from different locations around the world i didn't have a degree didn't have an mba degree i had a degree in education i was a teacher and so I was a small cabinet maker. So everyone's got to imagine there's this small guy working in his shop. And I had my shop at my home. I had two or three employees. I was just a little tiny nothing. You know, I was a little local cabinet maker. I did nice work. I made $40,000 a year back then. You know, I made a little bit of money. I made enough money to put food on the table and, you know, go on one vacation. I was lucky a year. I was a little cabinet maker. And then I'm thrust in, then I developed this one product and this product kind of blows up and gets really big. And next thing you know, I'm having to make phone calls to Portugal and, and to Spain and I'm importing materials and I'm dealing with, I go down to the local hardware store when I need something. So I'm, I'm, I'm struggling. I don't know how to do all this stuff and I'm figuring it out the best I can. But finally, the company starts scaling to the size where I need software, I need a consultant, I need someone to help me how to manage a, a, an operation that's bringing in products from around the world to manufacture my stuff. So I went to the local university and I asked, can you, is there someone in the business department that can help me? And they said, you know, hire, you should get a consultant. He can maybe come in and get you some software that can help manage all this complexity. So I brought this guy in and we looked around and this is the story I tell in my book. And I said, Tracy, can you help me? And he looked around and the bank president had been in my company the week before and give me a quarter million dollar line of credit. Wow. And, and he came in personally to approve the loan because they don't give quarter million dollar lines of credit yes. to people who don't have MBA and small stars because they fail. They waste the money. They don't spend the money correctly. They get it over their head. And next thing you know, the bank's holding the debt. But the bank president wanted to come in and personally say, OK. And what size so were you at this stage, uh, uh, Paul, we just to give a little doing, bit of context? Uh, three years, we were probably doing, uh, I would guess we were doing, uh, just guessing a million dollars a year right. in business. With right. what, Somewhere 10 right. people? Yeah, um, with the bank, maybe 18, maybe right. about 18, okay. somewhere right in that, that neck of the woods, I would guess. We we're probably doing more than a million, but right in that neck of the woods. And he came in and looked around, he's an older guy too. And he came in and looked around and he, I remember, I never forget, he leaned against one of the, my main machines and he said, Paul, I've never been in a company like this in my life. This is the most unbelievable company I've ever been. I'd give you any amount of money I, you wanted. And I'm like, look at him and go, damn, I'm good. <laughs> right? So that was, that was the, the situation. He was going, this place is so dialed in. It's unbelievable. A week later, this guy, Tracy, the consultant walks in, looks around and I said, Tracy, can you help me figure out how to do this inventory thing? And he looked at me and he said, you're clueless. You don't know what the hell you're doing. Oh you don't know how to manufacture. Right. And he was just kind of like tongue in cheek in it. But I was like, what are you talking about? He goes, no, you need to learn the Toyota production system. You need to learn lean manufacturing. You need to learn Kaizen. I'd never heard of those things before in my life. Right. And I go, what the hell is that? And, and so he said, well, I know these two kids from Japan, they can come in, they can help you. I, I, they were 10,000 bucks a week. They were, I mean, I wasn't going to spend 10,000 bucks a week. I was crazy, but I knew I needed to spend $10,000 a week because if I was that clueless and this guy thought there was something I was missing, I talked to my wife. She wasn't crazy about spending 10,000. I convinced her I was, I'm a bull in a china shop. I said, we're going to do this. I got to figure out how to do this. We brought these kids in and they looked around. They're speaking in Japanese. You know, they're doing all their thing, trying to figure out how they're going to help me. I think I was their very first client too. They'd never done it before. And they'd, they'd done it in Japan and, and been the trans, they were actually translators. And they were starting their own consulting based on being translators for the Toyota people. Oh, wow. Very and crazy, you were their first crazy. client? I was their first client. And so they said, okay, you know, we'll do it for this amount of money. And they came in and they started changing everything I was doing. They didn't make little changes. They tore off entire stuff and they changed it. And, and in one week, they took processes that were taking us 45 minutes, processes that I had set up because I was good with my hand. 
from 45 minutes to five minutes. Like what? Explain, well, give it, give, well, give okay, us an so example. Okay, so here's the example. So we made, in the beginning, we were making cover caps. We were punching out these little peel and stick cover caps out of wood and different materials to put over kitchen cabinets. We had to set up this machine, a die cutting machine to do that. And every time a customer would order walnut or white or black or rock, we had to change the machine. It was a setup. So that setup would take 45 minutes. We have to put a die in. We have to adjust everything. The tension had to be right. The adhesive had to line up. Everything had to be perfect. And so we'd run the machine and it would spit out a bunch of bad parts and we'd throw them in the trash. We'd make a little adjustment. We'd run the machine again and we'd do it. We'd walk over and get this tool and get that tool. And they looked at the whole thing. It takes you 45 minutes to set this up. It should take like five minutes. And I'm going, you can't set this machine up in five minutes. And they said, oh, yeah, you can. You don't understand waste. And they showed how much waste we were going through. And then they started chiseling away at that. And so now this die chain took five minutes instead of 45 minutes. So from the time the machine stopped to the time this machine was running again with good parts, it was five minutes instead of 45 minutes. And instead of a, a trash can full of waste, there was five sheets. That's incredible. And, and, and not like it's better than that. So after they shot, showed us this, one of my employees, Victor, a really smart Russian guy, he's going, man, this waste thing is like, I see the waste everywhere. He couldn't, nobody could see the waste, right? Everyone thought that was part of doing business. He's seeing the waste. He said, he said let's redesign the dye and change it so there's not as much waste in the dye. In three months, it added $30,000 of net profit to the bottom line. That's incredible. A month, a month. <laughs> And there's a lot in that which I want to tease out, especially the Victor and the subsequent Victors whom you attract mm -hmm. into your company. But you've mentioned right. waste there and you describe in, in, a, in a really refreshing way the, the eight deadly sins of waste in one of your books. Can you just mm -hmm. give us an overview of the and a, and a, a master class in waste, Paul? Sure, sure. I'll give it to you the way I did it. The, the last podcast I recorded, I did it and I got a lot of comments back from everyone saying, hey, I really like the way you said that because it was easy for me to understand. So here you go. The eight ways are as follows. You have a dinner party at your house. You invite another couple over. You and your wife are going to have a nice dinner. You make a salad. You make a salad for four people, but you really don't analyze how much salad you need and you, make a, you end up making a salad for six people, right? So the first waste is overproduction. You needed, a, you needed a salad for four people, but you made a salad for six, so you overproduced. Now, remember everyone who's listening to this story right now, do not memorize the eight ways. Do not use an acronym. Do not use some system. Do not do anything. Just remember this salad story. It's a story because when you understand that all waste really generates from overproducing, the minute you overproduce something, then all the other ways just go, whoa, they turn into a tornado, a vortex. So we overproduce the salad, right? So we get done with dinner. I get up out of the table and I have to transport the wasted salad back to the kitchen. So I, I pick up the extra salad. I take it back to the kitchen. That's transportation. So now I've, I've transported something that I didn't need to transport. Okay. Then I got to do something with that trap, with that, that salad. I'm going to put it in inventory. What do I need? I open up my refrigerator. I put it into the, the, uh, the refrigerator, but I've been overproducing my entire life. So I don't have a small little refrigerator like the ones in Japan. I got a effing sub-zero. I got a 48 inch wide side-by-side -side, stuff full of overproduction from freezer to refrigerator. It's I'm proud everywhere. of it. Proud of the right? size of it. And, yeah, yeah, I'm proud of it. And I think I'm smart. Yeah. And I think I'm a freaking genius because I got sub-zero refrigerator and then the truth of the matter is you're a moron that's the that's the part that's so that's why your lead is so exciting to me because it reveals your stupidity at a level beyond anything you could ever comprehend and you have to laugh at yourself at how stupid you are so now i got this giant sub-zero i've got inventory so i overproduced the salad i transported it back i stuck it in my giant sub-zero right I go off to work. I come back three days later. I open the refrigerator. Hey, I want something. To eat. Oh, there's that Tupperware, that salad. I pull that thing up. I open it up and I go, doesn't smell so good. Doesn't look so good. I got a freaking defect. You start to see this, how it all comes. It's this in everything you do from every email you send to all the information you gather and give to people. 
to everything you do, how you learn to kite surf, it, everything, you'll see this waste everywhere. So now you got a defect. What are you going to do with that defect? You got to overprocess it. You got to take it out. You got to put more salad dressing in to make it make it taste good. Oh, worse yet, you're going to open up the trash can. Then you're going to scrape it out, overprocessing, excess motion. You're going to take a fork. You're going to scrape it into the into the trash. And then what do you got to do? The trash fills up faster. Now you got to empty the bag, walk out to the trash can. You got to take it out three times a week instead of once a week. It's just like the waste has gone crazy. And then. Your wife's going, hey, honey, why aren't you making dinner? I'm out taking the trash out. I'm washing my hands from touching the trash five times a, a, a week instead of twice, once a week. It's just like everywhere. It's extent. And now the trash guy's got to take the trash out because around the world, 40% of food is wasted. Yeah. It's thrown in the trash. Could you imagine 7 billion people and 40% of the food is thrown yeah. out? So now we've got more trash trucks on the, on the, on the road. We got more CO2, and I'm not an environmentalist in the, in the way that most people think. But let me tell you, if you want to talk about lean, it's the greatest lean, green concept in the world. Green is bullshit. It's all, it's all greenwashing your brain. Hey, I'm going to pay carbon credit. You can forget about all that nonsense. You talk about becoming a lean thinker, then you're going to save the planet. Because you're not going to be wasting all the resources and overproducing them and, and throwing them out. So now we've got a, our dumps are 10 times bigger because we're throwing all this crap away. Then we have to have bigger machines to bulldoze it under. This is all because I made too much salad. We got, we got more environmental people checking the probes for, for uh, methane gas for the next 40 years. We got management. We got checked. This is all because I made yeah. too much salad. Yeah. Do you understand? <laughs> Me and 7 billion other people. The, and, and I want to come back to this because actually it's scale up week in the UK and every day the the scale up institute uh, and the UK government have been talking about the promotion of scaling with purpose which is the essence of simple scaling the and what we're saying here is actually if you devote yourself to lean by virtue of doing that you become a purposeful book company because uh it, it the, at, the, at the whole heart of lean is is the elimination of waste uh so i, I want to come into that in a little bit uh so we have our uh we have overproduction we have then the transport as a result of that uh we have the stocking because of the overproduction then we have defects because of the the failure to stock uh correctly we have then the over processing and the the dumping of the 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 defect. right and then excess motion so um, you've over processed you got to put more and then motion keep going yes so what's and then what's the next? customer then now now your customer's waiting my wife's waiting for me to make dinner because i'm out where where, where are you man i'm out dumping trash I'm a, so my the customer's waiting and and the worst waste of all is i've wasted my potential as a human being i'm spending my whole life as a hamster running around dealing with all the waste that i generate instead of using my brain and solving problems i'm taking the trash out this is <laughs> this is fantastic uh... so now you know why i'm so excited about it because i don't have to be a super environmentalist i don't have to be an mba from harvard i don't have to do any of this other stuff i just need to be able to see waste when you see waste everything in your life gets better it's so simple why could i how could i not be when i see you know before i used to be overweight right so what was i doing i was overproducing food eating it putting it on my stomach carrying it around blah, 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 you know killing myself you know and all of a sudden i go oh i see the ways and i mean we'll, we'll come to that because that initial kind of moment where the light bulb has gone off uh, by mm -hmm. virtue of what the consultants have just shown you uh, mm -hmm. has now permeated every aspect of your life. And I mean, you're, my goodness, uh, climbing Kilimanjaro, Everest Base Camp, you've done a couple of Ironman. I mean, it's just set this, this train in motion, which is uh, clearly- Unstoppable. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I, so Unstoppable. Let, let's come back to then the, the first 12 months post that light bulb going off in fast cap because the you talked about kind of what we what we're referring to here is a level of consciousness around waste and it's not that people are intending every day no, waking up we and just go, we're, we're just ignorant yeah we're ignorant. exactly so the word is ignorant so 
how do we move from that state of ignorance to a state of awareness? Take us over that bridge. And you know, if you take us back to fast. Well, the first step. Well, the first step is you got to check your ego as a leader. If you think that you're trying to protect your, like, if you're trying to say, "Well, I, I was already doing this," and you know, I already. No, 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 no. You are clueless. So the first step is you got to get your ego out of the way. I, I've spoken in front of so many people. I've stood up in front of thousands of people, and people have said, "Yeah, I was kind of. I'm kind of already doing that." And I said, I look at him. I go, "You are the exact person who will fail at least." The minute you start saying, I, nobody was doing it more than me. Right. And I was an abject failure at this. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? <laughs> Until you can get to that point in your life and you realize how far off. If it was taking me 45 minutes to do something in it, and the Japanese showed me how to do it in five minutes, I was an abject failure. They didn't take it from 45 minutes to 43 minutes. They took it to 45 minutes to five minutes. Yeah, I was freaking clueless. And you are freaking clueless. And unless you can approach it that way, You'll never get this. And I've seen this over and over again. All the people in the world that are doing two second lean, and it is global, it's everywhere. Every one of those leaders are just like, how can I be so stupid? So we have to put our hands up as leaders and admit that we are clueless when it comes to the elimination, That's right. eradication That's right. of waste, and then approach it with a level of humility and an absolute mm -hmm. desire to to learn. And you mentioned companies right across the world and companies close to me, the likes of Seeding Matters, I know our protege of the, the two second lead. Incredible. Yeah. Incredible. So just that, so there's that admission, Paul, uh, initially, and that desire to want to improve uh, mm -hmm. and approaching it with a level of humility. What, what's next? <laughs> Then you need something that I like to call that I learned. I always say everything I learned from someone else. Paul didn't invent any of this stuff. I learned this idea of deliberate practice. I, I had to be deliberate about creating a system that supported my new belief. My new belief was that we can improve everything. My new belief was that people are my greatest resource. My new belief is that we needed to focus on developing our people and not our bank account, not how much money we were making. So how do I create a system that supports that? It was very simple. The first thing we do every day in our company from the moment this revelation came to me was we started 3 sing our entire company for 10 or 15 minutes every morning and we never missed and we never have sweeping, just cleaning, clean up everything, sorting, getting rid of all the things out of our work area that we don't need. Look at your desktop computer right now. Look at all the files that you have arranged on there. Do you really need all that stuff on your desktop? No, you need to sort that stuff out, put them in nice little files so everything's neatly organized, create systems. So sweeping, sorting, and standardized, standardizing systems on your desktop, in your work area, in your kitchen, in your refrigerator, so that when you work, you can work with in flow. You know, we know as athletes, you know, that when you're in flow, when you're running, when you're in flow, when you're swimming, when you're in flow, when you're, there's, it's this magic, right? But when you're stopping, starting, it's, it's terrible. So you want to work in flow. So the three S scene every morning, so we could work in flow. We could have our tool right where we need it. We, when we needed the information, we could click one click and there it is. Not searching through files, scrolling, 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 because you took time to sort things out in the morning. So three S scene every morning. And then a morning meeting, we gather as a team, all 50 of us every morning, we never miss. And our meetings are half hour, 45 minutes long. Do not do that. 10 minutes is more than long enough. We have a very mature culture. It's like a university for us. And we talk about our problems. We show our solutions. We look at other lean companies around the world. We have a very robust university uh, style uh, morning meeting where we develop our people. So basically for the first two hours, hour and a half at my company, every day, we do not work. We do not work. We just develop our, our, our people and the way we think so that when we do work, we work at a whole different level. And 
I mean, the results of the company are just, they're not even, they're not, I, nobody, nobody would ever believe me. I, I tell it to people and they can't even believe, you know, what we're doing, but it's, and I just laugh at the whole thing because I think to myself, this is so academic. I mean, a hamster can figure this stuff out. And I invite people to go and look on YouTube. There's so many videos. I mean, you're so generous with sharing what has worked for you, where it's, lots of people i mean you clearly have an abundance mindset and even that we connected mm -hmm. more than a year ago i reached out to you you're straight back and you've been so generous with your time ever since and you know you approach everything with that abundance mindset and you share so much information around lean so you know i invite people to follow on from this podcast to go and search your company you on right uh, on 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 the website on some fantastic everything's uh, free yes uh, my books in you know 15 16 languages now i don't know how many languages there's always getting translated new ones always coming out but everything's free there's no no charge for anything the video's nothing you've you've mentioned people and people uh, well, i will you don't ordinarily connect or immediately connect the eradication of waste with people being number one uh, in terms of actually, you know, the, addressing lean concepts. Mm -hmm. You have a really clever, really innovative approach to recruiting people in. Tell, take us through that um, approach and also what you do. So you've alluded to the fact there that you spend a lot of time you know, developing your people first thing in the morning, every day, you know, you're constantly challenging developing your people. And whenever you go on to the website, you can clearly see there's a level of creativity and initiative being shown by your people. How have you cultivated that? So bring us back to how you recruit in the first instance, and then how you cultivate a culture of autonomy, of creativity, of, you know, high levels of initiative, uh, okay. which seeds lean. So the first question is how I recruit. Okay, so, and then how I cultivate. Recruit and cultivate, but I'm gonna go one step back even further because I think the listeners need to hear this. When I'm in Colombia and I'm riding down the street and a guy comes up, old, young, and tries to wash my windows on my car because that's what he's destitute to do for the rest of his life you know, earn 25 cents to wash the windows on my car. I look at that individual, that young man, that middle-aged man, whatever they are, because they're all different ages. And I think to myself, he is no different than me. I can travel around the world in 106 countries, and there is no difference between that guy washing my car and me. The only difference is someone, by the grace of God, developed me and educated me. And that human being has not been educated. And my heart goes out to him because I, I just think to myself how lucky I am that I was born in a country that valued education, that I have parents that valued education and developed me so I could not wash windows because there is no difference in the brain power and anything for that guy washing my windows and me. That's number one. And it's very important that you view life that way. And that's maybe why I'm so passionate and excited about this, because I see the same success that I've had in life in every human being I meet. I don't see any difference. I don't look at myself as special. I think of myself as very average. Right? Well, I, I, I challenge that, but um, whenever... I, I'm, I trust you. I'm inside my head. I know how average I am. There, there's nothing special about me. Just on that then, before we move to two and three, uh, do you have a daily ritual of gratitude because you come across as somebody who's incredibly grateful for the fact that you have been educated and for the, the fact that you get to travel the world now and evangelize? Yeah, the, the, yeah, I do have a daily ritual. It's so simple, it's unbelievable. It's every human being I come in contact with, the person cleaning my room to the person checking me out in the grocery store to treat them with respect and dignity and to think that's a human being. It's, it, be kind to them, be appreciative to them, thank them, warmly thank them. Don't do it, don't do it, hey, yeah, thanks. Hey, I really appreciate what you just did for me. Don't feel like anybody ever owes you anything. That's my attitude and disposition in life. Always, how can I take that person and the influence and power that I've been granted in life and lift them up? 
what can I do to elevate them and make them feel different today? Yeah. That's my ritual. Very simple. That's a beautiful takeaway. Um, you, you want me to answer the question now? How I hire? <laughs> <laughs> so recruiting I'm not, people. I, I, I'm, thinking, I'm thinking about that. Okay. So it's really simple. So we don't accept resumes. They're all lies. So don't send me your resume. I'm not interested. Send me a 60 second video holding your phone horizontally. Do not send me a vertical video. I'm very specific. I'll reject it immediately and send it back to shoot it horizontally. Think about how you're working your computer screen. Think about how you watch a movie theater. You don't walk into a movie theater and the, and the screen's up like this. We watch movies horizontally, not vertically. Send me a 60 second video. Tell me about yourself. So this is what it sounds like. Hey, my name is Paul Akers. I was born in San Diego. I had great parents, come from a middle-class family. I uh, went to Kearney High School. My first job was working for Bob Taylor. Uh, building guitars. And then I decided, finally got, got my head screwed on straight, went back to college at 20, struggled all through college, uh, started my own cabinet making business. And then at 37, I invented a product called the Fast Cap and I started this business and it was really tough in the beginning. Now we're all over the world. I love working with people. I love creating uh, new projects. I love innovations. I love exploring. And that's who I am. Yep. 60 seconds. You know, just tell me a little bit about yourself. Just enough for me to get a feel of who you are. Yeah. Send me that video on WhatsApp, Signal, Voxer, you know, text message. Don't send me a freaking email. I don't want to see an email. And it's all a test. It's all a test to see if you can listen and do something very basic. Very good. And more importantly, it's a test to see whether or not you're willing to try something new because right. nobody asked for this, right? Yeah. This is something who asked for Nobody asked for that. Richard Branson is not telling yeah. people, send me a video resume and send it directly to my cell phone so I can figure out whether I want to hire you. You know what I'm trying to say? So it's a test and we do everything differently. They send us that, that weeds out at least 50, 60% of the people because most people are not willing to do that. And then I know immediately they're an innovator. They're willing to try something new. They're, right. they're teachable. And then if I like them, we bring them in for an interview. If we like them then, then we offer them a test day. We pay them for the day. They work with all of our people. At the end of the day, we bring all of our people in, not the candidate. We bring all the people in. Did you like this person? Do you want to work with them? And if we don't get 100% from the eight or nine people that work with them, we won't offer them any more than that. If 100% of our people say, yes, this person's a hard worker. They're asking good questions. They're curious. We offer them a test week. We still have not hired them. They work for a week. They're with all of our people. We're putting them from station to station, area to area. We bring all the people in and we say, should we hire this person? Well, you know, they're kind of, they're always looking at their phone or they're doing this. You know, they really didn't ask good questions. And thanks, Bob. It was great. Uh, it's not, not a good fit for you. We don't hire them or we hire them. And it's a bulletproof system. It's virtually bulletproof. And it works for us. And that's what we do. It's very unorthodox. I, I, I love that. And we have tried tryouts in the past uh, in our own company very successfully but practically it doesn't often work because if the person doesn't have that week to give if the mm -hmm. if they're in a current job right. and they're looking to move then then obviously that uh, poses certain challenges for them but uh, I, i'm a big fan of tryouts where you you know where it practically works uh, so they're they're in the company you know what what's the culture like how do you cultivate or how have you cultivated this culture and as i say you get such a sense of it when you go on and see your videos and you've the guys there you know showing putting up their little vlogs showing how they've improved something today i mean they're not coming into a what we perceive as a traditional manufacturing environment going through the motions you know the nine to five mundanity mm -hmm. of in a manufacturing environment this is a highly creative uh mm -hmm. really fun culture where you referred to something earlier about the biggest waste is actually the the lack of uh use of a person's potential the waste oh, of the person's it's potential. the biggest one it's the and you're optimizing it one. yeah oh, you're and optimizing the, and we're, we're focused on it 100 percent. so I what mean, are you it's, doing it's our target it's what the are you goal doing? of the company to grow people. <laughs> if you were to say, what's the purpose of Fasca? It's not this big, long thing. We are going to change the world and make it a better place. For the no, no, no. Grow people. End of subject. And Nothing more. Grow people. And if you could give the listeners, Paul, three takeaways, and we'll come to the, the takeaways at the end, but sorry, three practical 
pieces of advice in terms of actually growing your people, what would those three pieces of advice be? Well, the first one is you got to love people. If you, if, if, if a leader, you think you're the smartest guy out there and everybody else is a minion, then you, you, you're wasting your time. So the first piece of advice is you, you better love people. You better have appreciation for humanity and what God has imbued into every individual in the world. And if you're not approaching it from that standpoint, we're, we're wasting our time. There's right. no, no need to even go on. Okay. So that's step one. Um, step two, if you want to do this, Again, uh, Brandon, one more time, say the question to me one more time. Yeah, so I'm, I want the, the listeners to take away three pieces of advice in terms of actually developing their people. So okay. we've talked that's a lot around I, people. Yeah. Okay, that's what I thought it was. I just want to make sure I didn't go off on some tangent here. So the first thing is you have to have your mind correctly orientated. The second thing is, just like I said earlier, you need to develop a system that 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 supports deliberately your new belief system or your belief system, and that is our morning meeting. Right. I mean, so when people come into our company, they're transformed instantly because everybody is thinking this way in the company. And it's like people say, do you have an orientation? Uh, they're orientated from the second they walk through the door because everything's different. Everybody's friendly. Everybody uses your name. Everybody's interested in helping you. Nobody says, that's not my job. Go talk to somebody else. Everybody's like, wow, how can I help you? So it's an instantaneous orientation that is not normal. Right. And then that attitude is supported by our morning meeting where we spend the time developing and learning together as a team. So the first thing is, get your mind screwed on, on where you're going and what you're really trying to do. Okay. I'm not trying to make more money. I'm not trying to build a company that's $500 million. I'm not trying to take over the world. I'm not trying to do it. I'm trying to grow people. So that's number one, then set a system up that supports that. And I don't know if there is a number three, cause that's all, that's all we do. We just, we have our values straight and then we, we, we grow our people and the result is our people get more done in eight hours in six hours than the average person gets done in 48 hours. Uh, excuse me, in four weeks, in, in a whole week, excuse me, not 48, 40 hours. I mean, I'll take six hours of my people against 40 hours of anybody else and they'll mop the floor with them. They don't even know what they're, they don't even know what they're doing. I mean, they spend, everybody else spends all their time walking around like little chickens with their head cut off and everything we're doing it flow boom 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 cool fun look at that new innovation it's just crazy there's a theme that is consistent with all of the successful ceos of scale ups that i interview number one is their focus on people it's mm -hmm. people first and without uh, prompting you you know a lot of this podcast is focused on your people Second is purpose, and inadvertently, you're saying by focusing on the reduction of waste, you become purposeful. Mm -hmm. uh, and certainly, you're making your contribution to the, the planet by eradicating waste. Mm -hmm. And in turn, you're very profitable in terms of, you know. That's the byproduct. It's yes. Not, it's not the target. It's just simply a byproduct of thinking of doing life correctly. Yes. In terms of the application beyond manufacturing, there'll be people listening who aren't uh, running leading manufacturing companies and mm -hmm. say, well, lean doesn't really apply to me. You know, I'm, I'm in the knowledge economy. I hear it all the time. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so convince those out there, Paul, who are saying, yeah, it's fine in the manufacturing environment, mm -hmm. but it doesn't apply in the knowledge economy. Can you? Oh, you what? You're not going to believe what I'm going to tell you. Okay. I'm not. I'm not going to try to convince anybody of anything. If you're this big a moron that you don't get this, <laughs> and you need me to convince you, I'm not going to waste my time trying to convince anybody of anything. This is an obviosity from A to Z. Yeah. If you don't get this, you're a moron. So, are there any? Are there any, like any habits, so, uh, you know, James Clear's role. Not the answer thought. you thought you were going to get. Me, right? <laughs> no, <laughs> that would be a waste <laughs> of my time to try to convince a moron of something this academic. Yes. And that it's very obvious to you now. So 
in order to, as I say, I was referring to James Clear's book, Atomic Habits. So right. you begin with those, it's, you know, the clues in the name Atomic. Uh, very small habits can lead to okay. significant results. So uh, give us, uh, the listeners, you know, two or three little things. If they have never heard of Lean before, they've listened to this for the first time, and they would like to start applying Lean into their business tomorrow, what are the the three things uh, you know that they should do tomorrow to to begin practicing, to begin setting the the seed, or to go down the forget path. about tomorrow, right now, right this minute. Okay, when you finish listening to this podcast, look around at everything you're doing because at the, the minute you finish this podcast, you're going to start some process, looking for your keys, making your lunch, answering an email. Uh, cleaning the bathroom, making the bed. I don't know what it is, but you're going to begin a process the second you get done listening to this podcast. I don't know what it is. Finding your hat. I don't know what it is. Look at that process and ask yourself, what bugs me? Yeah. What could be improved? Don't wait till tomorrow. Do it right now. And then simply pause, stop, and make a small micro improvement to the way it does. And then they do the next process. Say, how could I have done that better? Make, tweak it, try it, run an experiment. Oh, it didn't work. No harm, no foul. Who cares if you wasted a few minutes running the experiment? Who cares if you wasted a piece of paper running the experiment? Now you know what doesn't work. And the next time you're not gonna waste a thousand pieces of paper if you would not have run the experiment and wasted one piece. Run experiments nonstop. Fix what bugs you. That's all lean is. This is all. This is why it's so exciting. I'll give you a good example. Tight kite surfing yesterday. Okay, so I'm on my fifth day, and and I'm you know jetting across the water, and I'm watching my instructor teach me the technique on how to turn, initiate, and then come back. But I'm going 500 yards out, and so I'm way away from him. Think about this. I'm way away from, he's yelling, bar, hit the bar, hit the bar. <laughs> I can't hear a word he's saying, right? And I'm watching him right in front of me go, a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right. He pops in and out of the water. And I'm, I look at him, I go, Rodrigo, why the hell am I going 500 yards there and 500 yards there and you can, I can't hear you? Why don't I do exactly what you're doing right now, right in front of you? Why don't I see if I can go a little turn, go boom, and pop right back out, just right. And he goes, he looks at me like, that's a good idea. Like nobody's <laughs> ever thought that way before. Because I'm putting together the string of waste of being 500 yards out, him not even be able to, I can't even hear him, yeah. let alone see him. Yeah. And he's I, trying to yell at me instructions. And I've got water and wind and I've got the kite that's going. <laughs> and so I start doing it right in front of him. He goes, Whoa, you're getting it. And it's, it's like 10 feet from me. And I'm going from one leg to the other, top of it. And nobody sees this shot. Yeah, I've never seen anybody ever instruct anyone kite surfing the way I did yesterday, only because I can see waves. And case that it's it's lost on people listening, the fact that you have been kite surfing for the last two weeks, traveling extensively for the last couple of months, is testimony itself to the lean processes. Because your business, as you are now enjoying yourself, visiting countries that you haven't been doing, picking up activities that you haven't done before. This is what we say to, to leaders of businesses all of the time who maybe are anath anathema to processes and systems. See, mm -hmm. This will set you free. Implementing no processes and systems set you free. Now, what you wish to do with that free time or the capacity that you've now created by implementing processes and systems is entirely up to you you've chose uh to to kind of expand the, the quality of your life yeah and mm -hmm. uh which is which is wonderful in itself uh give give us a sense then paul of how lean has just permeated as i say every aspect of your life well nobody comes in contact with me for more than five minutes without saying that I'm a little bit different, you know, that I'm, I'm not very tolerant of the nonsense that is all around. Like yesterday, when I got out there, 
Rodrigo had the kite all set up and everything was done. And he goes, Paul, it's just the way you like it, right? Let's like get in the water and start doing it. I go, exactly. That he knows the way I think. I mean, what he's walking back and forth the car, getting the pump, getting this. I'm going, why are you walking back more six times? Get it all one time, walk out there, set it up, and let's get in the water. It doesn't need to take 25 minutes to set this thing up. It takes five minutes. And he sees the way I'm thinking. It, it, yes. Yeah. So it permeates everything in my life. And everybody that comes in contact with me feels it immediately. And I'm, it's not that I'm uptight. I just can't tolerate the, 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 the insanity uh, that people are wasting their potential. Let, let me go back to one thing that I did. I wanted to cue in on. Really what lean is, think about this concept too. This is another really powerful concept. From the time you pop out of the womb, you're given the breath of life. You take in that deep first breath of air. You're given a resource. The resource is air. Mm -hmm. The resource is life. All lean is doing is making you a good steward of every breath of air and everything that has been put into your responsibility. So I have the responsibility of a business, a company, of influence and the people. And I'm trying to be a extremely effective steward of the way I communicate right now, the way I'm communicating with you. Yeah. I'm trying to, I'm trying to grab the listener, just and grab them and go, do you understand what I'm talking about? I'm not saying no. And it's, it's just being a good steward of, of, of the research. No, no. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Yeah. And it, I mean, it, to say? it's, it's incredibly profound and clearly you're an exceptional leader in terms of the way you communicate and how you have, uh, purposefully devoted your life now to evangelizing about lean. I mean, you, mm -hmm. you share this with everyone i referred earlier in terms of your generosity you've traveled the world uh spoken within government in terms of actually uh seeding the message and getting the message out there around the the impact of lean in terms of leadership what do you feel are the characteristics let's say the three main characteristics of great leaders and you've met many well I always refer back to Rick Warren, who wrote the most number one best-selling book of all time, The Purpose Driven Life. If you want to have a great life, a purpose-driven life, you only need to do one thing. And he tells the secret. Here he's got a book that sold millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of copies. And he gives the answer on the first page, in the first paragraph, in the first sentence. You ready for this? It's not about you yeah. that's the number one characteristic i mean if you want to know the problems of the world it's egomaniac leaders it's, they think it's about them they're aggrandizement it has nothing to do with you the reason i have a rich life is because i've made my life about helping other people realizing that that is the essence of life there's no greater feeling in the world. I can have all the millions in the, in the bank. It doesn't make me feel like anything. But knowing that there are thousands of people around the world that have elevated their life, their family, and the people they're responsible for because of my passion to help them. I mean, that's the, that's the only thing that matters. It's not about me. It's about what I can contribute to the world. And it's, it's just very simple. So, I mean, I could give you a two and three, but why? Yeah. It's, and just, that's, one. it's just one. It's consistent with a great little book by a guy called Bob Berg uh, called The Go-Giver. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the, the essence, the thesis of that book is that ultimately the more you give out, the more you get back in. I know it may be overly philosophical, but uh, so yeah. you're living proof. That, it's basic. It's, ba that, it's basic that this works it's all it's all academic that's why when you say do i have to convince somebody i'm not going to convince anybody of this if you don't get this if you're not listening and you get this and you're throwing up all these rabbits this and that I'm, next so tell me you are clearly enjoying life uh you are looking younger than when we spoke uh nah, on good. video that's oh. that's that's the idea behind <laughs> lean health is it's, it's turning back the clock i mean there's no reason everyone you can you can reverse aging very simply 
And this is applying the lean philosophy to your life, uh, prioritizing your health mm -hmm. and well-being as, as as number one. And uh, yeah, you've a great book. You you referenced it there, Lean Health. I mean, you've applied lean to so many things, lean travel. Uh, it's uh, it's it's wonderful. Uh, what's next for you, Paul? Well, you know, my target has always been to change the world, and I have a specific way I want to do that. Some, some way, somewhere in my journeys and my travel, I'm going to come across somebody who is in contact with the head of a country, and I want to work directly with the head of a country on teaching the concept of continuous improvement to an entire nation. And by doing that, we would set an example of a small country, big country, whatever it ends up being, that this is if other governments could see what happens when you focus on developing your people that it could solve the massive problems that we're trying to solve and, and never come up with any viable solution for it so that's my ultimate target and i'm i'm sure sooner or later that opportunity will develop and well i've no doubt in, in making that connection between lean and social impact leading to purposeful companies i think uh, you you uh, you will be um, connecting at government level, undoubtedly, very, very, very soon. It's wonderful. Uh, you've lived a re uh, well. I would say, you know, you're, you're only uh, you're you're going through midlife now. Uh, let's say uh, you've lived yeah. a lot of life. Uh, you've you've travelled extensively. Ten, ten, ten lives in one life, really. Yeah. To be honest. So look, a huge amount of experience. A uh, huge amount of um, you know life experience. What three timeless takeaways would you leave the listeners today who are aspiring to both scale their companies and, in many respects, scale their personal lives? Well, I would say have some very good mentors in your life, some right. very solid people that that you can reflect with on a regular basis and, and ask some probing questions and people that are doing life correctly and that are making a significant contribution that you can always use as your benchmark. You know, I'll give you, uh, let me give people a great example of that right now. That's just so profound. It's almost hard to even wrap your head around it. Bob Taylor is a very close friend of mine, Bob Taylor, Taylor guitars. Uh, he did not go to college. He started, you know, this little guitar making company. I worked for him in the very beginning years. Today, they're the global leader. They make 800 guitars a year. Um, I mean, eight hundred a year, 800 a day, excuse me, 800 a day. I talk to Bob regularly and Bob is just, a, he's a profound mentor in my life, right? And you just, you just talk to him, you go, how can anybody be this smart and this capable? Every, everything he does is just like, Wow, it's just unbelievable. And this is how unbelievable he is. So Kurt Listick and him, they're the two partners who started the company. They gave this company away to their employees just recently. Now we're talking about a company, I don't even have any clue how much it's worth. It's gotta be worth half a billion dollars. I mean, it's wow. like an outrageous, it's an wow. outrageous company. And he this has is Taylor employees. Guitars? Yeah, Taylor Guitars. And he, and this is not public. I mean, I'm kind of telling you something that's not really even public that much. A thousand employees, he gave the entire company to his employees and Kurt and him basically walked away. Now they're still involved in the management of the company, but yes. th that's the kind of thinking, that's the kind of level of people. Yeah. Who does something like that, right? You see what I'm getting at here? Uh -huh. And so you got to be surrounded by some pretty, and when I say good thinkers, I mean, I'm talking about profound thinkers. I'm talking about people that are not thinking like everybody else. As you mentioned in one of your questions, A Contrarian's Guide to Leadership, uh, Stephen Sample, in one of my favorite books, this is contrarian thinking. I mean, yeah. everything I do is contrarian thinking. That book influenced me dramatically. That's why I do a video resume. I don't accept everything's contrary. Yeah. You know, uh, we, we don't have a mark. You know, we do tens of millions of dollars in businesses all over the world. We're in 40 countries. We don't have a marketing department. We don't have a sales department. We don't have an HR department. We don't have a financial department. We have six people in our office managing a very complex business with 800 products around the world. Six people. People would have 50 people managing what's going on in our company. We are contrarians. We reject summarily the way companies are traditionally run and the way they do business. Yeah, and I mean, 
in terms of in terms of the way you structure the organization i mean you're you, you mm-hmm. clearly are living lean within not only with on the factory floor but in the way you actually structure the business as well i find mm-hmm. that phenomenal that you, you you do not have this what we would consider kind of traditional hierarchy in terms of actually no, it's not crazy it's, yeah. it's, it's, well, you know, it's not just because i reject it because i want to be an asshole or i want to be you know different i'm rejecting it because i see the waste yeah. i mean our cfo works four days a month he comes in he analyzes everything i have a half hour meeting with him and it's over with and, and we're talking about tens of millions of dollars. I mean, every company would have a whole financial freaking department to manage this stuff. Four days a month. What's his name? David Bees. Uh, David is going to be the envy of yeah. thousands of C- CFOs yeah. listening to uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. this. I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy. I mean, we, we don't need all that bureaucracy and all those layers and all that crap. Because, and all, not because we just don't need because we see the waste. Yeah. People just pushing paper for the sake of pushing paper. Yeah. And what that does is it adds costs to our products. Then we can't pay our people as much. And then we have to raise our prices all the time. And it just gets exponential. But by by having this different thinking, so our people are paid really high. Our costs are wages. I, I mean, our, our products are very inexpensive and very affordable. We have more resources to innovate and give more creativity to save more yeah. time and money and energy for our customers. So in terms of the three timeless takeaways number one is find these profound mentor. mentors yeah in your- yeah you need you need good mentors in your life and that's what my goal is i try to be mentor as many people as possible people contact me non-stop you know guy from israel yesterday a guy from uh serbia the other day you know people are always contacting me asking me paul what do i do in this situation so i try to be a mentor to as many people as possible and virtually i'm a mentor to hundreds if not thousands of people but directly a lot of people all over the world and that's why people can contact me easily and ask me a question and i'll answer it yeah and i want to acknowledge you for that i really appreciate it paul it's uh uh, it's it's the exception rather than the norm uh Mm -hmm. so i want to i want to acknowledge that having great mentors give me yeah the the next one's going to be very obvious to you is i'm i'm a a fanatic about learning and reading and you know if you don't if you don't do that leaders are readers you know it's just like i'm 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 non-stop reading all the time if i could only read one book on your uh on your book shelf what would it be well, I'll tell you, I, I, I approach that with a little bit of reticence because one book is difficult, but I'll tell you the book that made that, that was the turning point for me in my life. It was Good to Great, Jim Collins, yeah. one of the best business books ever written, right? And I read it six times because every page, every sentence is, there's no fluff. You know, you read books, they say the same thing over and over again. You're like, enough, you know, I want to get to the end of this book. There's not a page in that book that is not like, Oh my gosh, this is unbelievable. But other great books I've read, you know, Henry Ford's book Today and Tomorrow. Henry Ford was Henry Ford was like so over the top. It was unbelievable. That book's available. I recorded, I spent tens of thousands of dollars. It's on my my app for free. I literally, like we got a Henry Ford type guy to read it. And you can listen. And, and Henry Ford had no intention of his book being an audio format, but it was so powerful for me. I spent the money and recorded it so the rest of the world could hear Henry oh, Ford. Fun read read the book so well today and tomorrow henry ford's unbelievable the titan about john d rockefeller yeah. uh, i could go on and on and on there's so many bad the steve jobs book the story of steve yeah. jobs autobiography it's just like crazy good the elon musk book is crazy good and yeah there's i could go on and on and on but yeah. there you go good to great number one yeah and uh hopefully our own book will be up there whenever it comes out at the end of this yeah, year but anyway yeah. <laughs> so exactly uh having great mentors uh, learning uh having a, a huge curiosity to learn and yeah. to read and the third one well i'm always challenging myself to do to be uncomfortable i'm a very good i'm very comfortable with being uncomfortable i mean being 61 years old and getting my ass kicked every day on this kite board is I mean, I'm literally being drugged across the water at 30 miles an hour with water, with salt water being injected up your nostrils. It's not comfortable, right? I've got a scar on my ass right now. I won't show it to you, 
But uh, here, I can show you the one on my knee from dragging across the quarrel. I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm, com I'm, uncom I'm comfortable with being uncomfortable. I'm always challenging myself. I'm learning Spanish right now. I'm 61 years old and I'm learning another language. So uh, always pushing myself and not saying, eh, I don't want to do that. Yeah, I love those. And uh, I signposted you to the the Wim Hof method uh, breathing before. And right, uh, right. part of the, the actual Wim Hof method is actually being the cold therapy uh, and it's getting getting yourself in ice you know I, I do it every day and it's just that getting comfortable with with being uncomfortable I'm and that helps that helps build a level of resilience which is uh, which is paramount to being a successful scale up leader so i right, love those right. three uh, so great mentors learning and reading and get comfortable with being uncomfortable, being uncomfortable. Okay. paul you've been an absolute star as uh, as you ever are uh, where can people reach you you're just i mean you're all over social uh, media but where, uh, where, where, where would you signpost people to if they've if they've 30 minutes to to have a look at your work where would you um where would you signpost them to well i have a website paulacres.net uh, everything all the resources are very well laid out there everything's free there's no real cost to anything i would tell everybody more than anything else I've spent a fortune on this, but my app, Two yep, Second Lean have Play, uh, you should get the app. It's very effective. I've got a live chat on there. So this is another contrarian guide to leadership. So you can listen to me read the book and you can say, what about this? S stop reading, push the chat button, and ask me a question. And an audio message comes to me and I'll answer the question. Who, what author in the world has ever done that, right? <laughs> No, send me an email right on the app. You can, you can message me and I'll answer it. Brilliant. Paul, thank you so much. I wish you all the very best with the kite surfing, uh, with the, the continuance of your, your travels and continued great success with, uh, with the business. It's, it's wonderful. Keep doing what you're doing. Thank Brandon, you. Thank you very much. I love what you're doing as well. Brought to you by paulacres.net, where you'll find all Paul's books and lean resources for free, including the new Two Second Lean Play app, like Audible, but free. To listen to Lean is Lean on the Two Second Lean Play app at paulacres.net.